Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Investing Sucks. So today I'm going to be doing something that I pretty much never do, which is talk about another YouTube channel. So I'm pretty sure a good chunk of you watch me also watch the channel called Everything Money. In fact, I can actually tell from my YouTube analytics that Everything Money is the number one most subscribed to channel that subscribers of mine are also subscribed to. And they are one of the bigger value investing channels out there. And if you do watch them, you'll probably know that they preach something called the eight pillar analysis process. So it's basically an investing process and it's just eight quantitative metrics that they apply to pretty much every company they look at on their channel. And here are the eight pillars here. And this is something that they've been having on their channel for quite a while now. And it's something you can tell they really believe in. And this isn't meant to be the only things that they look at, obviously, right? They do uh, say this very clearly that this is meant to be a starting point and is not meant to be the only thing you look at. And it's kind of just a way to efficiently look at companies to help guide further analysis, to know what type of things should you be looking at from a quantitative standpoint specifically. So they are, the five-year average price to earnings ratio has to be below 22 and a half. And then they also look at return on invested capital. They want that to be above 9%. And then the third and fourth one are pretty basic. They just want to see revenue and net income growth over the past five years. It doesn't have to be a specific amount. They just want to see growth there. Uh, number five is a decrease in shares outstanding. So the company has to be buying back shares, which that alone is going to rule out a lot of companies because a lot of companies that are, say, in the growth phase, which aren't necessarily going to be bad investments, are going to you know, get the X there. Six is an interesting one. They look at long-term liabilities as a ratio to free cash flow, and they want to see that less than five. And then five-year growth in free cash flow. So again, just growth, no specific amount. And they define free cash flow as just cash from operations, less capital expenditures. And then lastly, the five-year price to free cash flow ratio has to be below 20. So you could tell from these that these are all very value-oriented metrics. The types of companies that you can assume the eight that are gonna, you know, get the check for all of these eight pillars are probably gonna be more mature companies, probably in well-established industries that have been consistently profitable for many years and are value-oriented because some of these metrics, like for example, number one and number eight here, uh, are ratios below a certain amount. And then the decrease in shares outstanding, usually you're gonna see companies that you know, are consistently profitable and part of their capital allocation strategy is doing share buybacks. I mean, those are the only companies that are going to be doing that. So these eight pillars, from what you can tell by initially looking at them, you're probably going to get a lot of value stocks by looking at this. So I was curious to see what types of companies the eight pillars tend to lead you towards because everything money is one of the bigger channels out there. And a lot of people who get into investing, if they go to YouTube to learn about investing, are probably going to be guided towards their channel because they are, you know, they make tons of content, tons of videos, and they use the eight pillars in pretty much every investing video that they do. So I wanted to do a bit of an experiment here and do a few things really. One is see what types of companies the eight pillars tend to lead you towards. So, and then compare that to, I guess, the broader market. So like the S&P 500, for example, what sectors are they looking at? What, you know, industries, how big are the companies? Are they dividend paying stocks or not dividend paying stocks? How much dividends do they pay? So those types of questions is what I wanted to answer. And then what I also wanted to do is see how this strategy would have worked historically if you just followed it to a T, right? Because as Everything Money has said many times, it's meant to be a starting point. It's not the only thing they look at, obviously. But what would happen if you just followed the eight pillar process? What type of investment results you could get? So to accomplish those two things, what I did is, this is my uh, website here called Tickernomics. I'll leave a link to the description if you guys want to check it out. It's a website that I'm currently building now that's supposed to be uh, designed for value investors. And one of the key features on it is scripting. So this is a way that you can efficiently analyze data. And essentially what I did was I wrote a script that generates a list of the eight pillar stocks. So companies that meet the eight pillars. And the companies that I have on this website right now is basically anything that's on the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and recently I added uh, TSX stocks, so Canadian stocks. So I wrote the script there and it's a public script as well. So if you want to access this list, you can do this. So the same, you just gotta go to the website, create an account, and then you just go to public scripts here and then you'll see it uh, right here, as well as a few other scripts that I've created. But since I created it, if I hit my scripts, then I'll see it here. And here is the eight pillar stocks. So that was the first thing I did create a list. So now I know all the companies on those stock exchanges that are eight pillar stocks. And then what I also did was I ran a back test. So I basically created the exact same script, but five years back in time. 
And the whole point was to see what companies get generated and put on that list. So what companies meet the eight pillars, the eight pillar process five years back and then say, okay, what if we had bought say an eight pillar index fund? So we invested in all those companies at market cap weights. What would our investment results have been since then? Would they, would we have outperformed the market? Because if you do perform, outperform the market just by buying eight pillar stocks, then it's a pretty powerful strategy. So those are the questions I'm going to answer. So first I'll just run uh, the everything money eight pillars one here. So if I just click run here, it's going to say initializing and it's going to take a couple seconds before it loads. And then I'm going to get a message here, which says done generating the list. And then I have to go to insight tables to access it. So I go to insight tables, it'll pop up right here. So these are, uh, these are our eight pillar stocks. So you can see uh, there's quite a few. And then I got all the, the market cap as well as all the, uh, the metrics lined up here. And then I can do the same thing for the, uh, the back test that I did, which is also here. So this, this one here, so I can just hit run and it's gonna generate a similar list. Now, one thing you're gonna notice is there's gonna be fewer stocks uh, in the five-year back test than what is gonna show up in you know, the current eight pillar stocks. And there's a few reasons why I think this is. So again, I'll just go to insight tables and you can see here, there's here's the back test one and here's the company. So there's less companies in here. This is the back test and then this is what it is currently. So there's a lot more companies in here. Now, there's a few reasons why I think there's less. One could just be the fact that uh, companies today, maybe the companies today are just more cheap than they were five years ago. That's one possible reason. I don't have really any evidence to back that up. But I mean, we have seen a lot of stocks go down a lot in value recently as fears of a recession and rising interest rates and all that conversational pieces have kind of taken over the investing world. So maybe stocks are just cheaper now. And we've already established that a lot of the eight pillars of analysis do tend to be value oriented. Or it's also because simply capitalism is a brutal game and a lot of the companies, the only way a company is still going to be able to make it into this list is if the company's around today, because I have to look at the historical data that I have on the site and say, if the company went bankrupt or if the company got acquired, they're not going to be around today. So they weren't going to appear in the filter that I ran in order to generate this list because I need companies that are, even though I'm looking five years back, the company still needs to be on the stock exchanges today in order to make it to this list. So there it could possibly be a bit of survivorship bias in the five-year back test. So maybe we'll see that when we look at the actual investing results. Again, if we had purchased, say, an eight-pillar index fund five years ago and held it to today, that's one possibility. Um, but, you know, let's let the results determine that. So it's not quite a perfect back test, but I think for the purpose of just exploring it, it does give us some companies that would have been a part of that list had we ran it five years ago. So I think it does serve its purpose somewhat. So now that I've got the tables here generated, there is the option down here to export into Excel, which is something that I recently added to Tickernomics. And a few people are asking me if I could add this feature to uh, the financial statements as well, which exists now. So if you want to uh, download the financial statements in here, you can do the same. There's a button here, export to Excel. So just for each of the financial statements, if you want the data, you now have that option. So that's something new that uh, I've just added to it in the past week. So here is the Excel file that includes all the observations that are going to teach us about the eight pillars that Everything Money has in all their investing videos. So part one, I've already kind of discussed. So in the current results, there were 68 total companies. And in the five-year back test uh, script, there was only 21. And again, there's a few reasons why that might be. Some of the companies may have been acquired. Some may have been taken private. Some may have went bankrupt. It's also possible that stocks are just more cheaper now. So there happens to be more companies meeting those uh, value oriented uh, metrics as we talked about. But part two focuses on dividends. So I was curious to see, again, because they are tend to be value oriented stocks, are they you know dividend paying or how much dividends do they pay? So in the current list of eight pillar stocks, the dividend yield on them averages 3.6%. And 57 out of the 68 companies, which is 84% of the total, are paying dividends, at least some level of dividends, whether that's 1%, 5% yield, whatever the case may be. And in the back test, um, the average dividend yield was actually quite a lot higher, 4.4%. And the number of dividend paying stocks was pretty much the same. It was 18 out of the 21 stocks were dividend payers. So how does that compare to the S&P 500? Well, the S&P 500, which has a little more than 500 companies, there's about 400 of them 
uh, or at least 400 from basic research that I could find uh, that pay dividends, which means you're looking about 80, maybe slightly higher, about 82, 83% of the companies in the S&P 500 pay at least some level of dividends. So not really you know, a great insight there, but we can tell it probably is slightly higher for the eight pillar stocks. But what was the interesting insight about the dividend, the dividend side of things was the current dividend yield on the S&P 500 is about 1.7, really. But the dividend yield, as we saw on eight pillar stocks is much, much higher, you know, 3.6% currently. And then in the five year back test, it was 4.4%. So the amount of companies that are paying dividends is the same, but the amount of dividends that they're paying is much higher for eight pillar stocks versus the general S&P 500. So that I thought was an interesting insight. And I think it's because as we'll see later, when we look at industries, the industries that it tends to lead you towards are more legacy type of industries, not really these new wave industries, like all these tech companies that are do that are allocating more of their capital to things like research and development, you know, reinvesting back in their businesses, like hiring sales personnel, and that type of stuff, marketing for, but for these companies, they're more mature companies. So they are allocating more of their capital to dividends. So I wanted to also see if, how does this line up to what the dividend yield was in the S and P 500 going back many years, really, you know, has it always been consistent at around one and a half, 2% or has it kind of changed throughout time? So this is what it's currently, again, it's about 1.6, 1.7%. And I haven't done any audit on this data, so I'm going to assume that it's pretty much accurate and it goes pretty much every year. So at the end of each year, we can see, you know, about 2% and then it went down here to about uh, in the 2000s, 1999, it was just over 1%. But if we scroll down further here, when we get kind of into the 1980s era, that's when the dividend yield is matching what we're seeing with eight pillar stocks currently. And then if we scroll down even further, we can see the further back you go, the higher dividends are. So what we can learn from that is going back, say, 50 years or even 30 years, companies were allocating much more of their capital to dividends than they are today. And part of that reason is because shareholder buybacks have really been something that's taken off in the recent decades. Companies are spending a lot more of their capital on that. But I did think that that was a interesting insight of the eight pillar stocks because what you would learn from that is if you are looking at eight pillar stocks, you're going to be buying dividend stocks for the most part. So part three is the industry. So how does the eight pillar stocks, the composition of the sectors compare to uh, the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ here? So here's the S&P 500. If I scroll over, here's the NASDAQ. So IT, information technology, or just technology more broadly, makes up the majority of these indices here, we can see 26.7% here of the SP 500 and then the NASDAQ, uh, pretty big chunk, you know, 48%. And technology, so this is the current um, script that I ran for the eight pillar stocks. There was only nine stocks, nine out of the 68, which is 13% that are eight, that are uh, in the technology sector. The largest sector was actually financial services. And then if we compare financial services to uh, the sectors in the S&P 500, it's much higher. We can see 24% for eight pillar stocks versus only 10% here and much lower here in the S&P 500, only 5%, which financial services could be things like, you know, insurance companies that really a whole round of things, real estate would be in there. Um, and then the next highest category would be this one, which is industrials, which again, you would attribute industrials more to value oriented stocks. So 16%. Industrials was only about 8% in the S&P 500 and only 6% in the NASDAQ. And then if we look at the results in the back test, there's even less of a weight on technology. In fact, there's only one technology stock out of the 21 that appeared uh, in the back test. So only 5%, which as we know, is going to be much lower than we're seeing here. Um, and the largest sector, again, in the back test was financial services. And the second largest was consumer cyclical, which consumer cyclical in here 15%, which we compare to, I'd imagine that'd be consumer discretionary uh, here, which is 10%, and then consumer discretionary, well, much higher in the NASDAQ, actually 20%. So you can see clearly there is going to be a difference in eight pillar stocks versus um, just the SP 500 and general indexes. 
which to me, that is an important insight because naturally, if you're following this eight pillar process, which is being preached by everything money, you have to understand the types of companies it's going to lead you towards. Okay. And then part four of this is going to be the actual investment results. So like I said before, I did a back test to actually see um, what your investing results would have been if you had bought a market cap weighted index fund of eight pillar stocks five years ago and then held them until today, really. So what if you invested 1 million into the 21 eight pillar stocks five years ago at market cap weight? So here are the actual companies that appeared there. These are all the 21. Uh, there's a few that are uh, companies that I've heard of before. I've heard of this one before, West Fraser. Altria is one I've heard before, Southwest Airlines, uh, Avis Budget Group, which is a car rental service. But a lot of these I didn't, I haven't really heard of. For example, all these ones I don't think I've heard of before. And if we invest at market cap weights, a big chunk of our portfolio is going to be in Altria. In fact, 30% because they were by far the biggest company. And we can see that this number here represents their past stock price, so their stock price as of five years ago. And this was their current stock price as when I ran the script. So um, there hasn't really been much change in their stock price. But as we'll see uh, with Altria specifically, they're kind of an anomaly, which if I search them up here in uh, Tickernomics, I'll show you what I mean. A lot of their capital allocation has gone towards uh, dividends over the past few years. So if I take a look at dividends here, we can look at uh, the dividends that they're paying just in an absolute USD amount. We can see it's been going up and up and up steadily. Uh, throughout the past 10 years, really. So a lot of their capital allocation is going towards dividends. And if we look at the dividend yield, their dividend yield has traditionally been extremely high. I mean, even when you look at it down here, which appears to be low, this is still in the, you know, four and a half percent range, which is, um, that's above the S&P 500 average. And currently their dividend yields about 8%. So even though Altria, their absolute stock price hasn't really moved a whole lot, as we saw here, you, are, you have been receiving dividends. And as we saw before, a big way you get compensated holding these types of stocks is through dividends. But what were the actual results? So you would have turned $1 million uh, over five years into $1,438,000, uh, $1, which that return is only, it's less than 1% a year. But again, that's just looking at the change in stock price. As we saw before, you're getting a lot of dividends with the types of stocks. So if we add dividend reinvesting and we assume, say, a four and a half uh, to 5% dividend yield, which seems reasonable, maybe that's a bit higher than what it would actually be. But then your return, assuming you're also reinvesting the dividends that you receive back into the companies, uh, it would be about five to five and a half percent. And the S&P 500 over that time period did 11.5% to 12% per year. So you would have underperformed if you were only buying eight pillar stocks. So then I was also curious to see, what if you just had invested a million dollars at equal weights into these companies? So not investing in them at market cap weights, but just at equal weights. And what we can see here is that the percentage allocated, so it's going to be just under 5% since there's 21 companies. So we're investing $47,000 into all these companies. And the value today, it's you get much better results. You get um, about an annual return of 5.4%. And then if you add the dividend reinvesting on top of that, then you're looking at 10 to 10 and a half percent annualized return over the last four and a half, five years. But that's still underperforming the S&P 500. So from this, we can pretty much determine that only looking at the eight pillars is not a foolproof investing strategy. And this kind of ties back into really the main reason why I wanted to make this video. So it was partly to serve the YouTube investing community, because if there's a large channel out there that is really pushing a specific process of investing to their viewers, the viewers deserve to know how valid that strategy actually is. Now, remember before what I said about what the intention of the eight pillars is to do, which is that it's a starting point. I don't want to misrepresent everything money here by saying that these eight pillars are all they look at. That's not the purpose. It's really just meant to be an efficient way to understand a company from a quantitative standpoint. Uh, but I also make this video to show that there isn't really one foolproof filter or investing strategy only based on quantitative things that you can use to outperform the market into the long run. There may be some that certain quantitative filters, if you looked at certain periods of time, maybe they were able to outperform the market. But to be honest, I think that's more just due to chance and 
In my personal view, I think it's genuinely impossible to outperform the market using just quantitative filters for a long-term time period specifically, and not just say a few years. Because if it could be done, then some AI algorithm or machine learning algorithm would have already devised a strategy that could be used to do that. And they would have exploited it to the point where that strategy is no longer valid. So outperforming the market, it requires careful study of individual companies, individual industries to actually understand what aspect of their business is currently being overlooked or is misunderstood by the general investing public, whatever it is. It's something that most people have failed to recognize about a company and it's something that you firmly believe is true about the company and eventually people are going to realize that the company has that certain quality which is leading the company to be more successful than people would expect and thus you will earn market beating returns that's really what makes a company undervalued at the end of the day it's the fact that people just fail to recognize something about them and if you just focus on the number side, you're probably just going to end up buying value traps and you're probably going to underperform the market. This has become a key focus of my videos since I've been on YouTube. When I'm trying to project a company's future, I try to have some sort of qualitative backing for my assumptions. I don't just want to say that I'm growing revenue at 5% a year for the next seven years just because, you know, if I look at what it's done historically, that's what it's going to do. I try not to do that because... You know, that's really a foolish way to invest because you're probably going to be incorrect about your assumptions and you need to have some actual qualitative backing, some reasoning for those assumptions. Otherwise, you're really just doing guesswork at the end of the day because you can't just take past performance and project to the future. Again, you're probably just going to lead to end up buying value traps if that's the case. So in my opinion, you just have to marry the qualitative side and the quantitative sides. And it's the human judgment aspect of investing that Frankly, it gives us an advantage over the computers and the algorithms. So anyways, guys, that pretty much does it for this video. So I hope you did enjoy it. I hope you found it useful. If you did, then please leave a like and subscribe if you're new to my channel. And I'll see you guys in the next video.